Live in Western Oregon, this is NBC 16 News at 5.30. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Jacqueline Mazur. The nation is on the verge of a new movement as supporters push for change following the death of George Floyd. Racism and racial bias are deeply rooted in our country and change is likely not easy. Black Lives Matter supporters are calling for those in power like elected officials and police officers to make that change. Our Kelsey Christensen met with a local Black Lives Matter organizer and the Eugene police chief to find out what comes next. Eugene saw one of its biggest protests yet. Thousands of supporters of Black Lives Matter filled the streets of downtown Sunday afternoon. It's a movement sweeping the nation, seemingly a last straw of outrage over unarmed black people being killed by police. I feel like if you have a system that is meant to protect people, you can't have bad apples. Madeline Smith organized Sunday's protest. She said it there and she'll say it again. It's all about the lawmakers at the end of the day who can make change, holding police accountable. I think they need to be held accountable as any of us on the street would be held accountable. And if we assault somebody, we're arrested and we're charged. And if we kill somebody, we are arrested and charged. And I don't think police are exempt from that in any way, shape or form. Saying anyone involved in excess deadly force needs to be charged and convicted. I feel like they're kind of putting the message out that if you're the one physically doing the action, you're the only one who should be charged when I feel like these people, you know, they were helping, regardless of whether they were on his neck or not. Here in Eugene, Police Chief Chris Skinner says it's a consistent journey to being better. He says getting rid of the so-called good old boys club starts with knowing boundaries and submitting internal complaints against other officers if they see something wrong, which he says Eugene already does. I'm mindful of, of my privilege every single day, and I'm mindful, and we as an organization need to be mindful of the bias we bring to, to our profession. Um, every single day, and we work really, really hard on that. Just last year, El Aborio Rodriguez was shot and killed by Eugene police during an altercation. The Lane County District Attorney deemed it justified. Skinner believes their system of investigating use of force is reliable, though he says they keep reviewing things that happen. We try to always look at the, the training aspect of what what occurred, whether it was uh, in Mr. Rodriguez's case or more recently in uh, Mr. Floyd's case when he lost his life. Looking at what went wrong, what techniques are best used, and which techniques are not accepted. Smith says protocols need to be changed nationwide, adding to the accountability police should hold. And for the police to kind of back their officers when they use deadly force and it's not necessary, it sends the wrong message to the community. And for me, it makes me feel like I'm not safe. Reporting in Eugene, I'm Kelsey Christensen. After a weekend of protests ending with a massive march Sunday afternoon, the Eugene Springfield NAACP hopes people will continue to fight for change after protests end. NBC 16 Stephanie Rothman spoke with their executive director and joins us live again tonight. Stephanie. Jacqueline, yeah, that's right. Eric Richardson has been fighting against racial inequality for years. His latest fight is one that many across the country are joining in on, something he helped young activists fight over the weekend, as we just heard from Kelsey. Thousands flooded the federal courthouse in Eugene to listen to speakers share their frustrations. They also share their hopes for a better future where injustice and police brutality are no more. Protesters then marched to Alton Baker Park, protesting the whole way through. This is a life and death situation for black people and, and it hasn't changed. It always has been. And I think that sometimes we get wake up calls, which we need every once in a while, but we don't need death. Richardson believes protesting is good, but transforming that energy into physical change is much better. He hopes the outrage spilling over now will fuel people in Oregon to actively participate and vote. And voting is very crucial, a way that Richardson sees these days of protesting having a lasting impact. He urges everyone to take this time to make sure you register to vote and voice your opinions in the primary, because that is six months away from now. Jacqueline? A lot closer than we realized. Thank you, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Well, today, the family of George Floyd released the results of their own autopsy into his death. The independent autopsy found he died of asphyxiation from sustained pressure on his back and neck. The medical examiner listed his death a homicide and says his heart stopped while police restrained him. An official autopsy last week claimed the combined effects of being restrained, potential intoxicants in Floyd's system, and underlying health issues, including heart disease, all contributed to his death. Floyd died after being pinned down by a Minneapolis police officer who knelt on Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes. 
Floyd's brother, meantime, visited a memorial in Minneapolis. The video shows Terrence Floyd was barely able to walk as he made his way to the spot where his brother lost his life. Terrence eventually collapsed in his friend's arms as he tried to kneel on one knee. He was surrounded by a large crowd that was peaceful and respectful as he honored his brother. They eventually took a knee with Terrence. Terrence spoke at the memorial calling for peaceful protests. If I'm not over here messing up my community, come on, mess up yours. Then what are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? Y'all doing nothing. Because that's not going to bring my brother back at all. He says he understands people are upset, but says people are only half as upset as he is. He also urged the crowd to educate themselves and vote, not just for the president, but for preliminaries too. Well, next week, former police officer Derek Chauvin, who knelt on George Floyd's neck, is set to appear in court. He was originally set to make his appearance today, but was moved to June 8th after he was transferred to a maximum security prison. Chauvin was charged on Friday with third degree murder and second degree manslaughter. The Hennepin County Attorney's Office says Chauvin was kneeling on Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes. Protesters want the three other officers involved to be charged, too. Now, we caught up with Senator James Manning, who spoke about his plans to address excessive use of force from law enforcement. Manning, a former law enforcement officer, says standards for this line of work need to be high. He also wants to push for state standards on use of force, adding he believes officers who have a history of excessive use of force should lose their ability to work for other agencies. Uh, when we do selections for whomever we're going to equip with a, a badge and a gun, uh, which it also includes having uh, the ability to make a life or death uh, choice, we have to be very careful on who we authorize to do that. Not everyone is qualified. Senator Manning says with the current momentum, there is an opportunity to make change. Manning, in addition to other legislators and law enforcement leaders, is working on creating statewide standards on use of force. So I am moving forward and, and we'll continue to move forward with this conversation and later on in the legislation that will make sure that we are holding everybody accountable. That includes our elected officials. Manning says one of his goals is to create an open work group to discuss some of these issues. The work group would be open to public comment, including comment from law enforcement officers. <laughs> Governor Kate Brown announced today her request for the resignation of the Oregon Employment Department director was received. Governor Brown called the continued delays in delivering unemployment insurance benefits unacceptable. We spoke with a local photographer who applied for unemployment benefits after his studio closed during the stay at home order. He says the online forms were confusing and redundant and nearly two months later he has yet to receive a check. Most of us are making tons of money at this so to have our source of income completely cut off and then not have a lifeline to kind of grab onto is it's pretty rough it kind of it puts you in a puts you in a bad place mentally i think david gerstenfeld the paid family and medical leave insurance division director will serve as interim director of the department meanwhile back in 2009 the federal government gave oregon more than 85 million dollars to modernize its computers nearly all of that money is still sitting in a state trust fund <laughs> We are turning now to a first look at weather with our chief meteorologist, Josh Cozart, who joins us now in the studio. Hey, Josh. Hey, Jacqueline. I can tell you that the sunshine was a welcome sight, especially after kind of a stormier Saturday for us. But our temperatures still gradually trying to get back to where they were this time last week. 70s through the valleys out along the coast, managing to make it up into the 60s. And right now, seeing very comfortably in the low 70s with those clear blue skies overhead and radar and satellite showing much of the same through the valleys, the coast and cascades. Tonight, though, with the lack of rainfall, temps will be falling back into the mid 40s, but no need to fear the sunshine and warmer air does push its way back into our area. But today meteorological summer starts. That's a little bit different than astronomical summer. That's typically June 20th through September 22nd. Nonetheless, sunnier skies and warmer temperatures start to make their way back into our area. I'll let you know just what June has in store for us in just a few minutes. All right, sounds like a beautiful week ahead, Josh. Thank you so much. Well, after Sunday's rally in Eugene, health officials are concerned about a possible spike in coronavirus cases. That's because of so many people in one place. NBC16's Angelina Dixon talked with Dr. Patrick Ludkey of Lane County Public Health to address the potential risk. 
were in the Lane County Public Health Building Monday to discuss the weekend events and their possible connection to a spike in coronavirus numbers. Now, events like over the weekend don't cause the coronavirus, to be clear, but it's the close togetherness of them that causes the concern. Um, I think there is an increased risk that we'll see some more cases in five to seven days, the typical incubation period for this virus when people become symptomatic after exposure. Um, so we're going to be watching it closely, but I can't predict what's going to happen. Um, we're lucky that it happened at a time when the amount of virus in the community is low. Dr. Lucky says he's glad the events over the weekend did not take place in March when the coronavirus was most active. But no matter what month it is, the doctor says no mask is perfect. But a mask is better than nothing at all. And it's hard to remain six feet away when you're attending a large event with lots of people. So wearing a mask and cleaning high-touch surfaces and washing your hands or using hand sanitizer are really helpful. They're not perfect. So if you put yourself in a position where you are in close contact, and not wearing a mask and not doing hand sanitizing and such, you're at risk. He says the risk is significantly diluted being outside, but there is no prediction as to how many more cases may be on the way. The good news is how Lane County Public Health is trying to keep current numbers low. He says with surveillance testing, the health department is actively going out to find cases. When it's only one case, they'll then find contacts from that person to prevent the spread from there. And there is now enough testing in the community to fulfill that mission. In Eugene, I'm Angelina Dixon reporting. To recap coronavirus numbers statewide, Oregon surpassed the 4,300 mark. Two more deaths were reported by Oregon Health Authority, putting the state at 154 deaths. Lane County added nine more coronavirus cases and one new death. Lane County Public Health says there are 76 confirmed cases and one presumptive case, making that 77 total cases in the county and three deaths. The nine cases range from people in their 20s to 70s in the Eugene Springfield area. Only one person is hospitalized and the rest are stable at home. Lane County's third death is a 62-year-old man from rural Lane County. Public health officials say he passed away nearly a month ago and had multiple pre-existing conditions. The death was not initially attributed as coronavirus related until the Oregon Health Authority confirmed it was just last week. Moving to other parts of our region, Benton County has reported a total of 55 cases. Lynn County has 117. Deschutes County has the most in our region with 127. Douglas County has 27 cases. 25 people have recovered there. And Coos County stands at 31 cases, most linked to the Shutter Creek Correctional Institution. Oregon counties are nearing the end of their first three weeks in phase one of reopening. Governor Kate Brown released new criteria for applications to enter phase two. It includes timely and successful contact tracing. The governor's office says a minimum of 95% of all new cases must be contact traced within 24 hours. And a minimum of 70% of positive cases must be traced to an existing positive case. Finally, there can be no significant increase in cases. Oregon counties are nearing the end of their first three weeks in phase one of reopening. So far, more than 10 counties applied to start phase two of reopening, marked in yellow on the map. Applications under review in our region include Lane, Coos, and Douglas counties. Now, phase two is considered higher risk. The goal here is to increase crowd sizes and mobility. So this is what phase two looks like. Eligible counties can have in-person local gatherings up to 100 people with physical distancing. That number, though, is subject to change. People can also visit nursing homes again with limitations, and office work can resume.